I would love to have the same type of conversation happen when it comes to our mental health and mental illnesses, which would sound something like, I saw this therapist and they really understood the stress and strain that farmers and their families go through. They would be a great help to you because I think in that vulnerability is really how we start attacking that stigma by telling our own stories. Welcome to Rumination, the podcast that discusses and shares practical information related to, well, today to agriculture and its impact around the world. Hi, I'm Chris Quinn, your host, and today our discussion will be focused on rural mental health. And to address this topic, I am really pleased to be visiting with Monica McConkie, uh, who heads up Eyes on the Horizon Consulting. Monica holds a master's in counseling psychology and 25 years of experience in delivering mental health support. Based in Minnesota, USA, Monica currently works as one of two rural mental health specialists in the state of Minnesota, providing mental health counseling to farmers and their families. From Monica's perspective, it is critical for anyone touched by the ag industry to have an understanding of the emotional impact of current trends on farmers and on ranchers and on farm families. Her mission, to increase access to and remove the stigma often attached to mental health services in rural underserviced areas. Monica, thank you very much for joining me today on Rumination and to share and discuss your experience in rural mental health. Oh, thanks for having me. It's so good to be here. So I wanted to start off by you maybe telling the audience and sharing with the audience your journey. Um, your journey to uh, understanding your personal and professional journey to starting Eyes on the Horizon Consulting. Sure. Well, I am a farm girl, grew up on a farm in northwestern Minnesota. And when I was younger, we had beef and hogs and um, crops. And uh, I actually showed dairy, though, in 4-H uh, because I couldn't, I couldn't handle the thought of bonding with a beef animal for two years and then it being in the freezer. So um, we showed uh, milking shorthorns for, for our go. dairy shows. And um, so that really was the beginning of my journey. I was a teenager, or, you know, grew up in the 80s when the farm crisis was really difficult. And I remember my parents uh, really struggling with anxiety and depression. I remember coming home from school and mom being in tears that we didn't get our operating loan. And as a, as a kid, my thought was, you know, what does this mean? We're going to have to move off this farm that my great grandfather started and, and live in town. Our way of life is going to change. And so that really set the tone, um, for just being aware of um, mental health in general. Mm -hmm. So after um, school, I um, got degrees in psychology and in counseling. And for the past, you know, 25, 26 years, the number keeps going up. I don't know why that happens, but (laughs) almost 27 years I've been in um, the mental health field, primarily in rural areas. And uh, three years ago, I was able to... uh, become self-employed and focus on mental health and agriculture. So my every day now is spent talking with um, farmers and ranchers, farm family members, those who work in egg business, and also um, healthcare and behavioral health providers in rural areas in helping them understand agriculture. So when a farmer does actually get to their office, they can have some understanding and speak the language they need to to retain yeah. them as patients or clients. Creating that bond that's so important. Yeah, thank yes. you. Yes. So the current state today, mental health in rural farm communities, and, and does it or how does it differ from urban settings that we perhaps hear more about? Yeah, there are definitely some distinct differences. So we know that um, suicide rates among farmers, especially our male farmers, are higher than the general population. Um, Calls I get um, really speak to the difficulties that stress on the farm plays in relationships and the toll it takes on relationships. Um, So how, you know, how it differs when we look at rural to urban or, or agriculture to urban 
um, accessibility rises to the top of the list. We don't have the workforce in rural areas that, of course, is in urban areas. We don't have the number of counselors, therapists, psychiatrists, for sure, um, providing accessible care in rural areas. Um, and so there's that accessibility piece that if they do seek out care, they're often driving distances that are long. We all know that it's hard to get away from the farm because there's always work to be done. Um, so telehealth, teletherapy became a thing, especially with COVID. And while that has helped, I will say that many of our areas do not have adequate broadband access. Um, for them to do. There are some farmers that I am unable to meet with virtually strictly because of the broadband access issues yeah. on their farm. Um, and another issue I run into very regularly is, you know, our, our average age of our farmers is 60. So you have a, a whole lot of farmers that are older and, um, Many of them have hearing issues. And so when I am working with farmers and ranchers, either via phone or virtually, that becomes a barrier as well, that they're they're just not able to have the same type of uh, quality of session is in person. So accessibility issue, I think insurance is an issue. Our farmers are self-employed. Um, often if they have health insurance, and I know it's a little bit different in Canada, but here in the States, um, co-pays and deductibles are very, very high. Um, so they don't seek out care um, because of the financial burden. Um, and then stigma. Stigma in rural areas is still very alive and well. Um, you can't be anonymous in rural areas. And so everybody knows everybody. They know when your vehicle is at the mental health center. Um, they know if you're away for a couple months in treatment for substance use, and it it adds to the, I don't know, just the the wanting of um, hiding your vulnerability, of not wanting to show your vulnerability. Um, land competition for land plays into that as well. That if I if I am struggling and people know I'm struggling. Um, are my neighbors going to go to the person I'm renting my land from and let them know that I'm unstable and, and rent it out from under me? All of those issues really impact the, the access, I guess, of mental health care in rural areas, specifically to our egg producers. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And and to your comment, yes, I'm I'm based in Canada. My wife just retired from thirty three years working in mental health. I can assure you, the access to mental health is not particularly good north of the border, despite what governments might claim about wanting to improve it. So it's pretty right. frustrating. And and absolutely, you can you can just imagine the the stigma, et cetera, in rural communities. And so coming from a, a rural background, being raised on a farm, showing those. Mm -hmm. Really nice shorthorn dairy cows. Yes. Um, <laughs> and you've mentioned some of the unique challenges. And I guess we've maybe focused on the male because I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say, to still suggest that traditionally they were running the operations, but there's a ton of rural women out there, mm -hmm. whether they're producers themselves, their spouses, partners, mothers. And how is that impacting them and, and maybe also talk a bit about the LGBTQ plus communities and, and that exist in agriculture and mm -hmm. that are even further, maybe not looked after in their needs. Removed, sure. Um, yes, I work with uh, a number of women, um, all ages. Some are the primary producers on their operation and some are in those supportive roles, whether it's working off the farm or being um, the partner um, to the, the male in this case being the primary operator. And, you know, they have a unique set of challenges, especially those that are the primary operators. Agriculture is still very much a man's world. And so they, they struggle to have their voices heard, to be seen as competent. Um, mm -hmm. And so when I work with rural women, specifically women on the farm, there's a lot of self-doubt and lack of confidence in their abilities because they just haven't heard 
uh, feedback from those around them that they they're doing well, they're competent, they're making good decisions. And so it is a lot of uh, work around self confidence to help them see their their they have a voice and their voice is valid and important. Um, so that's a, a very common theme. Um, many, many couples um, are on my case, so just with general relationship issues, mm -hmm. uh, marriages struggling. So that is always a concern. Um, speaking to LGBTQ uh, community, you know, they are, I would say, an underserved and under noticed population in agriculture. And so, yeah, talk about stigma. Those folks are really dealing with stigma from a, a number of, of issues. And their sense of isolation in these rural communities is very pronounced. So I met with one young lady um, who was in the LGBTQ community, and she really was struggling with being the next generation on her farm, her parents were ready to transfer the farm over to her. But the thought was, do I want to be in this small community where I don't have a peer group and I'm not accepted? Um, and the political views are very different from my own. So it's impacting even on that level of continuing mm -hmm. the legacy of farming operations and keeping them in the family. No, absolutely. You can see that happen easily and and stigma right around mental health is still i don't know it's it's massive of what prevents people from getting the help they need and you've talked a bit about perhaps that challenge being exacerbated in a rural community maybe just expand a bit more in the hope of removing these stigmas that people are perhaps inadvertently putting there and not realizing it Yes, you know, my dream would be that we are able to walk into the the local gas station where the farmers gather for their cup of coffee in the morning and hear them talking about anxiety and depression on the same level as they're talking about their other physical health conditions. And so it's not unusual for us to be very open about physical maladies we have, whether it's, you know, arthritis or kidney issues or being a diabetic. And, and that information is often freely shared, put on social media, talked about openly, um, doctors being recommended and referred to, sharing of stories. And so I, I would love to have the same type of conversation happen when it comes to our mental health and mental illnesses, um, which would sound something like, I saw this therapist and they really understood the stress and strain that farmers and their families go through. They would be a great help to you. Um, because I think in that vulnerability is really how we start attacking that stigma by telling our own stories. And we're getting there. I mean, exactly what you're doing here. We are making progress in that area. Um, and so it's it's very exciting to see egg business, egg media, um, being supportive of campaigns and initiatives around stress and mental health and, and often even telling their own stories about their struggles. And so I think that's how we continue to make inroads that, you know, families that that experience a death by suicide, that farmers are still coming out to those families to help with harvest or bring food, that we're not excluding them because it's uncomfortable. Or if a farmer has to go to treatment for a month or two months, that there's still that outpouring of support in the same way as if they would have to go to hospital for cancer treatment for a month or two months. So we, we have work to do, but we are making strides to get there. No, 100%. And just talking about it, I guess, is it's no more complicated than that. Yeah. Yes. We talked about some of the unique challenges and you shared uh, your experiences from rural communities. We're making progress. Last 27 years of your career, I trust we're making progress. And what We what are making we progress. Yes, I, I believe I believe we are there. We will never eliminate 100 um, percent mental illness in the same way we won't eliminate physical illness 100 percent. 
However, when we look at things like um, talking about drawing the parallel again to physical illness, we look at all the prevention programs we've put in place. So things like campaigns around the dangers of smoking, um, buckle up when you drive, no texting and driving, all of those prevention campaigns that really permeate our society now and are, are accepted. We can do the same thing in a prevention aspect when it comes to mental health and mental illness. Like if you're struggling, talk to someone early on instead of waiting for it to get bad. Implementing the helplines, um, looking at the at ourselves holistically, like we can't separate um, our physical health and our mental health. We're all one being. Um, so we can work on those prevention types of campaigns which will continue to show improvement down the road. And, and I think we have. I think the conversation is more open um, than it was 25 years ago. I think there are better embedded mental health services than there were um, years ago. I think those services that are connected with our clinics um, are, are better. And, um, you know, we're looking at answers. Um, to questions, and we're we're building programs that meet that or attempt to meet that. So, yes, I am. We have we have a ways to go, but I feel like we're getting there. No, absolutely. Thank you, and thank you for your part in it. So, bringing it back to some of the things that the audience can learn and practice, some basic mm -hmm. skills to improve our own mental health, and also to be aware of the mental health around us of, of our customers. Um, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what can we be doing to make sure that one, we're healthy and two, we're aware of the, the situations with our clients or family? Yeah. I love that question. Um, and I'm so glad you brought it up because those people that work with farmers and ranchers, with egg producers, uh, it is hard when you're working with chronically stressed people day in and day out. And eventually it's going to take a toll on you. Um, so self-care is very important prior to you feeling burnout um, and, and struggling with your own mental health. So if you, if you look at it just baseline, drink lots of water, eat healthy foods, get some exercise, like physically take care of yourself, sleep, figure if you're not getting good sleep, figure out why and fix it. Um, so th that level. And then from there, it's really about making sure that you are doing things in life that feed your soul, like something outside of work. Are you able to leave work and spend time with family or friends or doing activities that really feed your soul? Are you able to talk to people when you are struggling, whether it's a peer or a mentor or supervisor, um, clergy? you know, somebody trusted, therapist, counselor, doctor, you know, seek at, out help. You don't have to struggle on your own. So those are all things we can do to take care of ourselves. And I could talk about that all day long, right? Because we, we can get into our thoughts and, and is the way we're thinking helpful or unhelpful. And of course, that's a lot of the work I do in counseling. But yeah, yeah. really focusing and being aware of if, if you're struggling and then taking some steps to um, get help for yourself. And as far as noticing um, kind of warning signs, if you will, in the producers that you work with, if you know somebody, you know their personality, you know their appearance, their moods, you know who they are, like their baseline functioning. If you start to see changes in, in that baseline functioning, you know, then it's kind of time to perk up and pay attention. And it, it might be something really subtle. Like the other day, I had a, a guy who raises beef. Um, he was very overwhelmed, um, kind of feeling hopeless for the future. And he made kind of an offhanded comment about how he sold uh, a whole bunch of his heifers. 
And it didn't really make sense in continuing the work that he was doing because, right, they would have been the ones calving next yeah. spring. And so that just kind of popped a little warning flag up in my mind. And I asked him, are you, you know, are you thinking about suicide? And sometimes it can be that subtle. Like, is there unexpected um, sales of land or livestock or equipment? Um, does the, the way the farm site or fence lines or animals look, is it, is it deteriorating? Um, are things not being taken care of? Um, is the family in upheaval? Uh, are they saying things like it's not worth it anymore? Um, I, it, it, the future is hopeless. It's never going to get better. And then, of course, we just want to we want to let them talk and make sure we give time because we know the egg business folks are often their counselors, and they are the ones that can break that isolation because they have to see their nutritionists and their veterinarians and their feed people, and um, yeah. so they are in that very unique place of being able to break the isolation that. Farmers can sometimes, you know, keep everybody else on the outside. So, yeah, listening ear, checking in. If you're worried, let them know why you're worried, what you're seeing, asking who their supports are, um, how you can help get them in touch with those supports, and then carrying resources. So wherever you work, whatever area, there are resources in your communities. Grab those brochures or whatever it is, flyers, cards, and keep them in your truck with you when you're traveling. So you have information to give to those farmers that are struggling. Oh, thank you. It's just very great practical points mm -hmm. to remind ourselves that, uh, you know, our, our job's not done after we balance the diet or mm -hmm. uh, help with that difficult calving. It uh, goes beyond that, the relationships we have. And, and perhaps we'd know what to ask if we're asking about production issues, but maybe just simply asking, are you thinking about suicide? Tough question. Yeah. Tough question, but maybe it'll jog the mind to open up and then help to get the help that they need because yes. it's real. Wow. So that's just me and as simple as keeping some resources in our file folders. We, we keep information about products and we keep the customer's ration. Uh, do we keep a copy of the hotline for mental health for them to call mm -hmm. would be a good addition to that. So thank you so much for that. Monica, I want to really thank you for all the work that you do and, and um, for moving forward on this topic and the time that you've shared with us, your knowledge and experience today. And thanks for sharing that with, with our audience. Very good to be here. Thanks for having me. So I want to also thank the audience for taking the time to listen to Rumination Podcasts. And so that you don't miss any current and past issues, you can find us at jeffo.ca. And there you'll find this episode and others. You can also reach us through Jeff, again, jeffo.ca, Apple and Google Podcasts, as well as Spotify. This podcast was brought to you by Jeffo Nutrition, precision nutrition for a growing world. And have a great day.